welcome Ashley. Um, we have spent some time in most of our recent podcasts debating the, um, the fluctuations in the Australian property market, which has, has very much been in a strong upward trend. And I thought it would be beneficial for this month's quick take to focus on, I guess, a little bit on what has driven the property market in terms of the recent 18 months in particular, but also what you see as the outlook from here, particularly on the core Australian property markets of Melbourne and Sydney. Well, that's uh, that's a good intro. Thanks, Vinny. Um, we did, I did did quite a bit of work on property over many many years, but because uh, I like I like fundamentally I like property residential property in particular in Australia. Uh, did a bit of work on the last monthly report covering lots of aspects of property and the valuations and where they come from and the debt levels, etc. The big news, of course, at the moment is we had this massive bubble in property prices over the last eighteen months since COVID, since the free money bonanza uh, restarted again. All of which is great. Free money is great. Um, you know, you can get a loan for two percent for thirty years. Uh, you can get interest only loans. So that's that's put a real rocket under, under a, a residential property prices. So with the RBA committed to keep rates at zero for years, nobody believes they'll do it. But they're, they're they're keeping promising to keep rates at zero for at least say three years time until middle of 2024, even if they start to raise rates earlier than that, it'll still be a year or two. Um, so they're not allowed to raise rates. They've committed themselves. They're waiting for wage inflation, which is slow to come through. Um, so meanwhile, APRA, who's the regulator, the bank regulator, uh, in 2004-14, they brought back lending control to try and control lending growth for banks, to try and control the interest-only loans, to try and control the investor loans, to try and take the hit off the market. What, the, what are the main levers that they employed to do that? Well, in that case, it was limiting the, the volume of loans and limiting the percentage of interest-only loans and the percentage of investor loans. So they did that in 2014. The rules on the banks to say this, but, only, this portion of your total balance sheet and loans can be investor or interest-only loans. That's right. So they, they used those old-style banking controls while the RBA was frantically cutting rates. Uh, they used the controls to actually restrict lending to housing, which it did, and it, that ended the bubble in 2014. You had a nice sort of flattening off and a bit of a dip. Same thing happened in 2017-18. They, they then in, reintroduced some lending controls to, again, speed bumps and speed limits to try and limit uh, bank lending growth into housing. And that also slowed the boom. Uh, so we had an, another flattening of, of prices and activity, which is, um, uh, which is good. Then we had the the, uh, the GFC, the um, the COVID sell-off, of course, where everything froze for a while. Central banks and governments flooded the money with free money and handouts and welfare and what have you, all, all of which is now being tapered off. But the housing boom has been uh, inflated by this free money boom. So um, the uh, you know I, I wrote a story that, uh, and I've, I've in past monthly reports, I've shown you actually my statement from Advanced Bank in the late eighties, showing how interest rates went from thirteen to fourteen and a half to fifteen to sixteen to seventeen to eighteen percent in my home mortgage in nineteen eighty nine. And put that into context, your level of mortgage was my level of mortgage was two hundred and forty thousand dollars, and I was earning my wife and I were earning around about a hundred thousand dollars each. So that was that the interest on that was three and a half thousand dollars per month mm. on a two hundred and forty thousand dollar mortgage. My daughter this year, early this year, borrowed four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. She put in about one third equity, one third cash. She borrowed four seventy five thousand dollars, which is twice what I borrowed. But the interest on that interest only loan, which I couldn't get back then. Is only seven nine hundred and seventy dollars. It's about one fifth of yeah. the monthly cost in her pack pocket for borrowing twice as much what I did uh, uh, twenty five years ago, thirty years ago. Um, so that gives you an idea of the sheer amount of money you can borrow now. That's why house prices are so high because there's so much debt. People's borrowing capacity so relative to their income, albeit it's worth yeah. touching on. APRA again have then gone back to this area and started to look at, okay, well, how do we put some sort of breaks on the market? And the so area we, they've gone for is your borrowing capacity again, but looking at... Yeah, a bit different this time. So the, this time around, uh, APRA has got a, a bunch of... Basically, governments uh, for many decades controlled lending growth from banks to as a way of controlling the market. Deregulation in the 80s took away that. But uh, in 2014, 2018, and again last month, APRA... The regulator has started to control directly, put their hands into the banks and say, you can and can't do this. So this time around, they've said, well, the step one to try and soften that housing bubble is to change the formula. When you're going for a loan, you have to now, the bank, the lender has to now assess your lend, your borrow, your repayment capacity 
on a margin above your current rate. So they're saying, well, if your current rate's 2%, you've got to assess the, the capacity to pay on the basis of 2% plus a 3% margin. Now, you know, five, 10 years ago, that was a 6 or 7% margin. Now it's only 3%. So what the bank's saying is, that the, the government's saying is, get used to the idea of your 2% mortgage going to 5% because yep. it probably will. Uh, and that'll be the start. So if that, uh, the, the immediate impact of that is, we've seen two impacts over the last month. One of them is there's a frantic rush of people to try and get lending approvals before that comes in at the end of the month. Yeah. So they'll not be able approval. to borrow as much once that's in place. Because if you can borrow, if you can borrow, say, half a million dollars last month, you can probably only borrow four fifty thousand dollars next month. So that fifty thousand dollar difference comes off prices. So there's less money chasing the same set of assets, which means supply is, is the same, but demand is lower, so the price will fall as it did the last two cycles. So that is the first step. So if that, that's certainly the second impact of that has been the first one being a rush of people to get approvals on the old rules. The second impact has been quite a, anecdotal only, but quite a clear set of evidence to say that the sheer activity in auctions, uh, now you're leading up to Christmas as well, and, and you've got COVID lockdown, so it's hard to tell, but more than likely that has put a bit of a dampener on the runaway property bubble. Many other countries have done the same thing. Mm. New Zealand has done the same thing last year and two years ago, plus they've now started to raise rates. Singapore's raised rates, Norway's raised rates. A lot of companies in Eastern Europe have raised interest rates already. The Fed in the US will start to raise rates in the next few months. They'll start to pay off the, uh, to, to slow the QE um, bond buying program first. And then probably next year, they'll see a one or two rate rises out of the US, which will flow around the world. Australia, that'll raise the, um, uh, the US dollar, which will, will, will cut the so we, so we I guess you paint a picture where we know rate rises are eventually inevitable and, and they're going to come sooner than certainly what have been previously pro projected by the reserve banks. Yep. If we take the international view for a decade or more, looking towards Australia, that, that our property market was horrifically speculative bubble territory and, and set to burst like parts of Texas and other parts of America, you know, a decade before. Um, yep. is is now the, the rising of interest rates, given the increased borrowing levels, a, a warning sign or something that you, you view as a big major threat? Um, so a couple of questions I always get is, one is, uh, are house prices going up or down? And the answer is, in the long term, they'll always go up because we've got these great immigration uh, uh, increases in people, which will return after the COVID lockdowns are lifted, I believe. Uh, plus, we've got this limited stock. You've got NIMBY councils. You've got lots of restrictions in housing in the big cities. So I'm, I'm a bull on overall housing, residential housing in general over the long term. Um, in the very short term, you never want to overpay. You, you can go to one auction one day and a house will go for a million. And the next day, the same block next door, the identical house, even with maybe vacant land, the same block of land will go for 1.2 million only because three buyers showed up and not two. Mm. Well, it was raining on the Saturday. So it's not a commodity market, i.e. every single block or house is different to the one next door. So pick your target well. Once in a lifetime deals come along every month. If you miss out this time, walk away. There's another great deal down the road. So don't rush into it. Don't overgear and never be a forced seller. I've had a lot of gearing in my life over many, many years when I was younger. I've had no, I, I paid off my last book. By the way, 18% mortgages are a great incentive to pay it off and never borrow again. So I paid off my last home loan in 98 and I haven't had a home loan since. Um, so I've had a lot of debt when debt was cheap and you buy right, but never, never, never be a forced seller. Never take on more than you, you can chew. Um, so if you've got um, income that's stable and reliable and you're not relying on too many things to pay off the interest and you've got tenants, you know, you've got to bank on 20, 30% vacancy rates. People bank on zero vacancy rates. So don't get carried away with your prices. Be prepared to put your checkbook away and walk away with if it goes. And that never compete at an auction. You'll always pay too much. Pick your targets. And um, long term, you're going to be fine as long as you don't borrow too much and as long as you are never a forced seller. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent advice. And on that, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, yes. Ashley. Good luck. See you next time. Cheers. Thank you.